We've already prayed, but let's do it again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And once again, turning to Our Lady, we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray, pray for, for us who have recourse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, Second prophets, third teachers, workers of miracles, healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in various kinds of tongues. But are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all interpret? You should desire earnestly the higher gifts. I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away, for our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And so we have been talking about faith and hope, and now we come to charity, a very special kind of love, the uh, last of the theological virtues. Charity. Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. In recent years, we have had all kinds of homilies and sermons and conferences and workshops 
dread the term, on love. Now, that's uh, certainly a noble thing to do. But uh, very often, they miss the mark. Love is not merely a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love might at times involve a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's a lot more than that. I've often told the story of how sometimes when I'm traveling, a local pastor will... uh, It used to happen more when I did parish missions. I don't do parish missions anymore. But when I would spend a week or so at a parish, the pastor might ask me, you know, I've got this young couple and they're preparing for marriage, and they are clueless. <laughs> they don't know a thing about love. Could you uh, fill in for me this evening at the, <laughs> the pre cana counseling, you know, the getting them ready for marriage? And uh, I said, you know, and I'm not, parish priests have a special gift. I do not have the gifts of a parish priest. Uh, I would most likely last one week in your average parish. They would kill me, or I would do them. (laughs) But it's not likely it would last very long. I have my own gift, but parish priests have very special gifts, and a good parish priest, God bless them, they really... That, they're the heart of the church. They, they, they're in there on the front lines day in and day out. But anyway, so I'll show up on the appointed evening. I, I always feel inadequate for it because I know the parish priest, he's better at it than I am. But, well, you know, somebody new, hey, uh, they feel like they haven't succeeded. Maybe, maybe by some miracle I can get through to them. So on the appointed evening, the um, young couple shows up. Sometimes not so young. And uh, instead of the smiling, benevolent face of the pastor, they encounter me. (laughs) No doubt wondering what they've done wrong. But I'm always friendly. Ah, wonderful. How are you doing? Joey, Susie. So, uh, you're in love going to get married. Well, uh, yeah, Father, you know, we're in love. That's what, yeah, we're going to get married. Right, love. Great. Okay, Catholics now, right? I'm talking to two Catholics about to get married, experts on love. Joey. He might be Italian from Brooklyn. I get along real well with them. Hey, Joey. You're in love. What's love? Ah, come on, Father. You know love. We got feelings for each other. Feelings. Feelings are up. Feelings are down. Feelings are all around. If all you got feelings is that you got trouble. What else? And how about the, bro- the blushing bride-to-be, Susie Q? You're in love. What's love? Well, you know, Father, you know. Well, we, we've got chemistry. Yeah, that could blow up, honey. <laughs> what else? They almost never get it. So I help him out. Look, if you're in love, would you say you desire the highest and best thing for the sake of the one you love? Yeah. You can't deny that. If you love someone, you desire the highest and best thing for the sake of the one you love. So, well, what's that? By the way, they are Catholic and have been Catholic From the moment of their baptism, they might be 20 or 30 years old. They've been around for a while. They've never heard these questions before, most of the time. 
All right, so you love each other. You desire the highest and best thing for each other. What's that? Well, come on, Father, you know. A nice house. Children. Good. Job security. Good. Early retirement. A dog named Spot. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. What else? Those are good things. What else? What else? What else? Come on, Father. What else could there be? Catholics, right? Experts on love. <clears throat> then the punchline. How about heaven? If you're in love, you desire heaven for the one you love. And if the answer is anything less than that, you don't know what you're talking about. In plain English, if I love you, I want you in heaven with me forever. And anything less than that just misses the mark. It's insufficient, period. That's it. Now, I've said that a million times since I started preaching, and some of you have heard it almost that many times too, and you exhibit monumental patience <laughs> sitting there and uh, just taking it, you know, while you know, geez, again. <laughs> but it's true. You say it over and over and over again, it's absolutely true. Charity. The greatest of all, the virtues. I love God for his own sake, not for what he can do for me. Have you ever noticed how many of us, and I'm, I mean, I'm guilty, problem, no doubt I am. Remember, I already told you why God made me a preacher. I've got to listen to me more than you do. You know, you, you, you're putting up with me for a few hours this weekend. I've got to put up with me day after day and year after year. God help us. I run into people all the time. Somebody told me, I says, well, every night, Father, my wife gets into bed with me and with you. <laughs> and there the tape comes on in your voice. First time I've heard that one. <laughs> Maybe it'll be the last. <laughs> but I appreciate it. I think. <laughs> he was a good sport anyway. <laughs> one man I remember his wife would play my tapes over and over and over again, and it drove the poor man nuts. He was absolutely out of his mind. He couldn't get away from me. Well, they were Irish, and they went to Ireland on vacation. This is a true story. They went to Ireland on vacation, and uh, they weren't in the, in the in, in-law's house five minutes in County Cork. And he hears this familiar voice <laughs> coming from a back room. I know that voice. And in the back room was the 90-year-old Irish grandmother playing my tape. <laughs> Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things. We can stop there for a moment. I remember one time hearing confessions during Lent, and... Uh, you know, you get, especially during Lent, you get in a confessional. As always, I was in a strange place, never been there before, haven't been back since. And I'm hearing confessions, and they come in. I'm in a confessional. And, you know, priests know how that is. You're in the box, and you hear the same sounds, you know, over and over again. Somebody comes in there, they kneel down, clunk, in the, in the great slide, slide, and uh, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And, you know, you hear, you've hear heard that a million times, all priests have. And so th this one was slightly different, however. It was the same. 
Bless me, Father. Well, I have no sins. <laughs> That's a new one. Bless me, Father, for I have no sin. Like Bishop Sheen used to say, I thought Our Lady was the only one immaculately conceived. I'm telling you, that's what I, I reckon it was, a, it was a, a, a male voice. My trained ear knew a young male voice, probably late teens. Bless me, Father, for I have no sins. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, why are you here? And I said, wait a minute, your mother made you come, right? Well, yep. <laughs> and she, she's sitting right out there, isn't she? she said, ah. I said, you don't have no sin? No, don't have any sin. I says, well, let me help you. The first commandment says you should love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. See, this definition of charity says to love God above all things. Would you say that you put God first in everything in your life? At all times and in all ways. We said, well, no. I said, aha. Got you on the first one. <laughs> and then we proceeded to go through the Ten Commandments. It took a long time. <laughs> Especially when I got to the sixth one, I said, you got any, anything against the sixth commandment? And I, and I remember, I was once 17. And I remember, go, it was, and I was 17 in the days when all the kids went to confession on Saturday. Right? And the adults went at night, kids went on Saturday afternoon. And we lined up around the, the church. And I remember examining my conscience. And, you know, I remember, the, I learned the commandment. It says, ah, sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. I said, home free. <laughs> I know I didn't commit adultery. I mean, I have not been messing around with any married women. At the age of 17, I knew it. Hey, absolutely, I'm clean. So I know how 17-year-old minds work. We got to that one. Well, oh, anything there? Oh, no, no, no. I said, um, you got a girlfriend? Yep. Then there was a pause, a long pause. And I said, are you having sex with your girlfriend? Yeah. Well, don't you think you need to confess that? Oh, okay. It's funny how the Holy Spirit helps in those moments. I said, are you by any chance living with your girlfriend? How do you know that? My mother tell you that. <laughs> nope. When you moving out? What do you mean, when am I moving out? Well, contrition uh, has to have a firm purpose of amendment. You're sorry for your sins, you're confessing your sins, but that means you intend not to commit those sins anymore. And then he got a little upset. What? You mean to tell me? You're, you're saying I have to move? Yep. It took a long time. The poor people were lined up out there waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> I think his mother was praying. <laughs> it worked. You know, he seemed to have good, good disposition in the end. He... he, he he said, okay, he would do it. I found out later he did. Started to straighten out. To love God above all things. And that means you don't put anything created in the way. Anything. Money. Your job. I run into doctors all the time. Especially this past year. Some of you know what I mean. I'll, I'll try to tell you about that in between later. But uh, phys good physicians, I run into good physicians. Some not so good, but I run into good physicians. And they're severely tested. One told me how the hospital, he's a surgeon, 
hospital where we work, they just expect them to do abortions. That's unusual, by the way. There aren't not, not many hospitals, really, relatively speaking, that uh, require that. Although, in many medical schools now, they're required to go through those classes. And, of course, some of them won't. And so that, that's a, uh, a grounds for a battle. But in any event, they tell me how their faith is tested. They have to make decisions on a daily basis. My profession, my professional stature, my income, God. To put God above all things. To love God above all things. How... Uh, why? Because of what he can do for us? No. Because of who he is. He's God. God. We love him for his own sake. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. And as I told you in the previous conference, you've got that vertical and horizontal dimension. And the vertical has to be in place first. The relationship between God and the soul. The vertical dimension. In other words, union with God comes first. Don't think you're going to be able to love your neighbor as yourself until you have that relationship with God in place first. You know, in recent years, we have stressed the communal dimension of the church. And there's nothing wrong with the communal dimension of the church. The church is a family, you know. Uh, the Eucharist, uh, certainly it is a communal <clears throat> meal, but not only that. Preeminently, first and foremost, it's the holy sacrifice, the same sacrifice of Calvary, offered in an unbloody manner. These things are not mutually exclusive. These things are not contradictory. These things are complementary. And we have to, we have to understand that. And accept that. But I love God above all things for his own sake. First and foremost. I have to cultivate a relationship with God. You know, I've often said to people, look. We're told that we are to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Our whole heart, mind, and strength. Not half-heartedly. Not half-wittedly. Our whole heart, mind, and strength. That's how we're supposed to love God. If you are in love with someone, don't you think you'd want to know about them? Right? Uh, you married folks when you were getting to, when you first met. You want to know everything about each other. You want to spend time together. If you're in love, you want to know about the other person. We're supposed to love God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Shouldn't we want to get to know him? You know, that's what I was talking about before in faith, studying the faith. Studying the faith isn't some kind of uh, abstract exercise in, in um, knowledge. It's a personal relationship. Remember what truth is. Truth isn't something. Truth is somebody. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so if we love him with our whole heart, mind, and strength, we want to get to know him. And so the connection between love and truth. I'll never forget when I was young, another one of the stories I've told 8,000 times, how I, one of the first times I ever said Mass in my home parish, and uh, actually it was the first time, it was my first Mass. My first, what, what we call uh, our first Mass, priest. Uh, after they're ordained, they have what's called a first mass. They usually go to their home parish or someplace like that where uh, they'll celebrate mass. Now, I had a lot of first masses. My, my first mass actually was uh, concelebrated with the Holy Father uh, at St. Peter's Basilica. That's where I was ordained, 62 of us. And so um, we were, we deacons, were ordained priests. And then, of course, the mass continues and we concelebrated with the Holy Father. So that was my first Mass. That was concelebrated. My, my real first Mass was the next day at St. Peter's in the crypt 
under the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica in what's called the Clementine Chapel uh, over the bones of St. Peter. I celebrated my first Mass. And then my second Mass at St. Ma Mary Major and my third uh, at um, St. John Lateran and my fourth at St. Paul outside the walls. The four major basilicas of, of Rome. But my first Mass, in quotation marks, my first Mass was in my hometown, in my home parish. 10 o'clock Mass, Sunday morning, the big one. And the pastor was a very good man, a friend of mine. And so he arranged everything. The, the, we had a, a very beautiful church, uh, like a basilica, really. For a parish church, it's a, a big, beautiful stone uh, church. Held quite a few people. I don't know how many. But anyway, th it was packed. And so uh, my first Mass. And uh, I remember I, uh, in looking at the readings to see what I was going to preach on for the first time, um, it was one of those moral things where Jesus is saying, and no liar will enter the kingdom of heaven, and no fornicator will enter the kingdom of heaven, and no thief will enter the kingdom of heaven. I remember looking at that reading for the first time and saying, oh, no. <laughs> Man, I got to preach on this first time out in my home parish? <laughs> These people know me. But I said, well, I'm not going to wear out my welcome first time. I'll just five minutes, that's it. I'm not going to overdo it. Best laid plans of mice and men. Well, I read, read the readings, got up, started to preach. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes. The walls were shaking. Man, I hit every moral point from A to Z. People were trembling. <laughs> I think it went 40 minutes. And the pastor, who was off in the corner, trying to raise money at that time for a new roof, <laughs> sweat was pouring down. <laughs> and I know exactly what he was thinking. He says, this boy's going to ruin it all in one day. I finally finished. I knew I was in trouble. Processed out, waited outside, and nobody came out of the church. <laughs> they just sat in there, and I, I didn't know what they were doing. I thought they were plotting my demise. <laughs> finally, one came out in tears. He thanked me. Another one, another one. Now, the last one came out. And uh, I knew I was in trouble. And she said, we don't need all that truth stuff. All we have to do is love. All that truth stuff doesn't matter. And I asked her, what makes you think there is some kind of opposition between love and truth? Love and truth are names for God. St. John tells us God is love. God himself tells us, Jesus is God, I am the way, the truth. In the lives. So there's no opposition between love and truth. God is love, God is truth. So that was one of the first engagements I had as a priest in preaching. Jesus makes charity a new commandment. By loving his own to the end, he makes manifest the Father's love which he receives. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And again, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The commandment of love. In my own simpleton way, I try to convey to you what it really is, though. You know, in English, we have English is a great language, but it it has certain inherent deficiencies, as all language does. But one of the inherent deficiencies of um, of English or any language, really, is that well, look in, in English, I, the uses of of one word, the, the word love, right? I have two Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. 
I love my dogs. Uh, I love pasta. I love football. I love fishing. I love you. I love God. It's the same one word, but there are various gradations, facets, meanings, significations. But we only have one term that expresses it. Greek, Koine Greek, was more apt, more adept at expressing th these realities. You know, they had three, actually four, words for love. But the word that we're dealing with here, we're actually dealing with a translation of a translation, but caritas, or charity, Christian love. Okay? That, that um, really comes from the Greek word agape love. That's Christian love. That's the kind of love that we're dealing with. What, is, what kind of love is that? Self-sacrificing love. When, when I say, I love you as your brother in Christ, it means just what I said before. I love you. I want the highest and best thing for you. By the way, that's St. Thomas Aquinas' definition of charity. If I love you, I want the highest and best thing for you. That's heaven, eternal life. And I'm willing to do anything and everything to get you there. And you might not want to go. Oh, you would never say that in so many words. Sure, yeah. If I ask you, and I don't mean you, I'm talking in general terms, because I know that you're good Catholic people, but if I would ask, you know, in general, the average person, you want to go to heaven? You know, assuming most people do believe in God, by the way. Uh, they would say, yeah, of course. They may be living by, like, just outright pagans. But if I say, you want to go to heaven, they say, yeah. Very few people would say, I'd love to go to hell. <laughs> there might be a few deceived idiots who would say that, by the way. But most would not. Most would say, yeah, I want to go to heaven. But do their actions indicate that. No, very often not. So when I say, yeah, I love you, that, that mean, and if you love me, if you love each other, if you love your husbands, your wives, your children, your parents, your friends, now you need to think about this. This is right at the heart of this discussion on charity. Are you willing to pay the price? Talk is cheap. How often it has been said, oh, I love you. Baloney. A lot of times, young girls, teenage girls, college girls, they'll be at mission maybe or someplace and they'll tell me, oh, well, Father, I have a boyfriend. And I'll never forget there was one. I went after I finished a mission. I don't even know. I might have been in Tennessee. I might just have been in Tennessee. And I went to someone's home for uh, dinner after the mission. And, uh, or it might have been Florida. In any event, <laughs> the, the people whose house I, I was at, a very beautiful house, beautiful home. And the man uh, says, well, my daughter's getting ready to go out on a date tonight. And his daughter came in. They had been having a family discussion. <laughs> you know what that is, an argument. And um, the girl came out, and, they, you know, here I am. I walk in the front door, and I have to be an arbitra arbitrator, right? So, well, she's going out. She's only 16. And, um, and, you know, mom was a little more understanding. Dad wasn't so understanding. Oh, I don't know why she has to be going out on dates. She's only 16. And mother said, now, now, dear. And so the girl comes in, and you're beautiful. A really beautiful girl. And they said, how, what do you think, Father? She looked at me, and she said, yeah, Father, what do you think? I said, honey, I think that you wouldn't even leave the house till you were 39 <laughs> if I were your daddy. 
And that, of course, that's why God didn't allow me to be a parent. I don't know how to do it. I don't have any grace for that. But you ain't getting out of the house. You're going to live in the closet till you're 39. And that's all there is to it. Period. A lot of time, you know, the old story. Girls, watch out for men. They're all no good. Except when they get older. Then they're okay. Because then their brains kick in. <laughs> they start to think with brains instead of other things. So, authentic love, though. Really. The older I get, the more I think about it. You know, if you love somebody, help them achieve their supernatural end, really. Help them get to heaven. Don't be an obstacle, a stumbling block. I know people, men and women both, well, I don't really know them, but I've known them for a few seconds when they walk through a confessional. They're, they're, they're left scarred, wounded, guilt-ridden, they shouldn't be, but they're left that way because of the sins of their youth. Now, sins that could have even happened with the one they're married to. But they confess them, and they should let it go, and God forgives and God forgets. And that's the truth, but we don't. It sticks. Don't be the source of somebody else's misery. Love. Love is not a selfish thing, not a self-centered thing. Love is a self-sacrificing thing. Fruit of the Spirit and the fullness of law, charity, keeps the commandments of God and his Christ. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you want to know if you have love, charity, authentic love, you can ask yourself, do I keep the commandments? That's the test that Jesus gave us. If you, in fact, love, you keep the commandments. It's very simple. Love of enemies. Love of the poor. Very important things. The sacrificial nature of charity. Charity, the greatest of all, the virtues. The practice of every virtue. Now, we've been talking about virtue from last night on. We talked about the human virtues, the cardinal virtues, the moral virtues, and then we went into the theological virtues. Charity is the greatest of all virtues. And that, that reading I read to you at the beginning from 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, that very famous passage on love. The practice of all the virtues is animated and inspired by charity, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Charity is the form of all the virtues. It articulates and orders them among themselves. It is the source and the goal of their Christian practice. Charity upholds and purifies our human ability to love and raises it to the supernatural perfection of divine love. My father was not a charitable man when he was younger. My father was a rough, tough, brutish man at times. He had a sensitive side to him, but he just grew up in a rough kind of a way, and it hardened him. He had a rough life, and in later life, he was a very charitable man, a very kind man. Although the old guy could pop up without notice at any time. 
and he could get pretty gruff. I remember a defining moment with my father. I hadn't seen him in 15 years, maybe. And uh, after I was ordained, we had been, we'd been estranged. My father left my mother when uh, I was 12. And my mother raised us, for the most part. And uh, I didn't speak to my father for years. Then I was ordained a priest, and uh, my father's sister, my Aunt Louise, said to me one day, you know, uh, you and your old man ought to bury the hatchet. Getting older, and I said, well, yeah, I'm all for it. You're right. So she said, good, I'll set it up. Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> <laughs> that was Aunt Lou. And... Um, so my dad came over to have lunch with me. He came into the town, my hometown, where I was at the time. And, uh, we had lunch. And then he gave me a car. You know, it, was, it, had, it had been uh, his car. It had 103,000 miles on it. But it was a good car. And uh, I didn't have a car. So he gave me that. It was a Jeep. And um, it was great. It was a wonderful thing. And, and he said to me, as we were about to part, we were only together two, three hours that afternoon, and he said, I wish I could have been a better father. I wonder how many people, mothers, fathers, grandparents, priests, whatever, I wonder how many of us in history have said at some point, I wish I could have been a better whatever. I've already said it. I wish I could have been. I'm not even finished yet, and I've already said I wish I could have been a better priest. Well, that was a defining moment. Something happened at that moment. I think God heard that like a prayer. And my father entered into a new place in his life. He began to suffer. And in the ensuing seven years, he had over 30 surgeries, constant pain, surgeries on his back, surgeries on his eyes, surgeries on his heart, three open heart surgeries, 10 Bypasses, valve replacement, surgeries on his hands. I remember Lent a few years ago. As, as we're going into Lent now pretty soon, I, it's the same routine for me. It has been every year since I started. I enter Lent and I go into the desert. I'm telling you, I go right into a constant period of constant activity. I'm on on one airplane, off another one, constant. Travel, suitcases, that's all. That's all it is for Lent. And I was um, preaching missions all around, and my dad had his third open-heart surgery. And he was in Los Angeles at St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, and I'd be preaching someplace, and I remember he had the surgery. Now, he couldn't find a doctor to do it, by the way. Interesting that Dad couldn't find a surgeon. He had had two open-heart surgeries already, and they're very, very reluctant to do a third. He had significant amount of heart damage, and the prospects of his survival of another operation weren't good. Nobody do it. All the surgeons in the Los Angeles area said, no, no, Tony, you, you know, we, we, can't, we can't chance it. You'll die. You just wouldn't, you're not strong enough. You wouldn't make it. My dad was, um, had been uh, an old tough guy from the streets of New York, World War II in the Navy. You know, he fought in the South Pacific. And he was in the Seabees. And uh, he'd fought the Japanese in the South Pacific. Guess what kind of a surgeon <laughs> operated on him? Yeah, I'm right, Japanese one. <laughs> That's the only one he could find. That's the only one who would do it. Now, he couldn't breathe. He'd take three steps, and he'd be out of breath. He just couldn't breathe. 
and his quality of life was being more and more diminished, that's a very difficult way to live. You, have, you can't breathe. It's frightening. So dad had the operation. I think he had the operation on a Saturday. I was preaching, of course. I flew home on Sunday. Didn't even have time to unpack my suitcase. Got on another airplane, flew down to Los Angeles, rented a car, drove to the hospital. Walked up to the intensive care unit, went in, there was my dad. Went in. Now my dad in his day, he was not very tall, but a little taller than average for his generation. But he was a very strong, stocky guy, powerful, built. And um, he'd been about 210 pounds in his prime. And I would say he was 80 pounds in a diaper when I walked in the room. And the tubes and the IVs, unconscious. And I looked at him for a long, long time. And those words, that expression came back to me. I wish I could have been a better father. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are as far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. Redemptive suffering. He had entered into a new phase of his life, a more powerful phase of his life. He didn't regain consciousness while I was there. I stayed a couple days. I flew back home, had to get ready, go on another mission, preach the mission. Same deal. Next week, got on an fl airplane, flew down to Los Angeles, rented the car, drove to the hospital. Week after week after week, he hung between life and death. He'd wake up, he'd be in great pain. Couldn't eat, of course, for a long time. Finally, he recovered, more or less. He had had a rather large number of the, uh, oh, those the little strokes that they have, you know, from the heart-lung machine. I forget what you call them, TMs or something like that. Um, and so he had damage, some brain damage, a um, little paralysis. He couldn't speak properly. But he, he came out of most of that eventually. I, I went to visit him. I remember one time I went down, his back, his spine was bothering him, his terrible pain. He had several back operations. He sat in the Cherry couldn't sleep. He couldn't lie down to sleep. It hurt too much, too much pain in his back. So he would sit up all night. He couldn't find any comfort physically anyway. So he'd sit in the chair. And then I'd see him in the morning and uh, say, how are you, Dad? He said, great, great, never better. And all the time, he never complained. I'm sure he complained to his wife. I'm sure there were complaints. I never heard a complaint. I said, gee, Dad, I hate to see you suffer so much. He shrugged his shoulders and he said, ha, suffering. He said, everybody's got to have some suffering in life. He was from that generation that has been called the greatest generation. And there's a certain truth in that. He, he's, you know, one of those folks who lived through the Depression, went off to war, World War II. Different generation. Was a great generation. He didn't understand love, but he lived love in the last years of his life. And I am convinced to this day that my father's suffering, and I have to say my mother's suffering too, breathed life into my ministry as a priest. I know that someday I'll find out 
that my father and my mother and certain other people that I know kept me alive, kept my priesthood alive. Not too long ago, somebody said to me, do you realize you're reaching millions and millions of people worldwide? And I said, I've heard that doesn't register. Last time I was down here in May, Bill Stedelmeyer over at EWTN told me, you know how many people your catechism series is now reaching? Potentially. I said, no, Bill, I don't know. One billion. It doesn't mean that on a given Sunday of one billion people are watching, but they could be if they all turned it on. It's there. That boggles my mind. Do you have any idea how much pain and suffering is behind that kind of proclamation of the gospel? A lot of little souls. My mother, my father. Those who work with me. You have no idea the quotient of pain necessary to accomplish so noble and lofty a task as the proclamation of the word in season and out of season. I'm kind of oblivious to it because I'm just the mouthpiece, kind of go on. No merit of mine whatsoever. Just all God's gift. But if we ever had eyes for reality, and we will someday, we would see what goes on. The charity. Loving God above all things for his own sake and our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. Self-sacrificing charity. Crucified love. There is no apostolic fruitfulness except through crucified love. None. All the human effort, the merely human effort under the sun will not account for one single soul. Union with the Trinity. That's the only thing that results in apostolic fruitfulness. I can work my fingers to the bone and accomplish nothing if it's merely human labor. I have had countless people tell me, people who've been dying, bone cancer, dozens, just that. Let's just, I, there, I have so many cases I could tell you about. Let's just stick to the cases of people who had fatal bone cancer. Know anything about bone cancer? Very, very painful. Way to go. I have had dozens of people with bone cancer tell me, Father, God's inspired me to offer all my pain for you and your ministry. I remember one little sister, religious sister, in Ohio. I can picture her just as clear as if it were yesterday. She came to two or three of my conferences. Oh, it would have been back in the mid-90s. And she said, I'm dying of bone cancer, Father. But it's okay. I'm perfectly fine with it. But I'm offering every bit of it for your ministry because I know it's important. I remember one... uh, 14-year-old girl. I don't even know where I was. I don't remember. Someplace in my travels. They said, would you come over and see this little girl? She has brain cancer. And uh, she has your picture by her bed. And she listens to you. And somehow she has an affinity with you. Would you please come and see her? And I said, sure. And they had her on the uh, 
living room sofa propped up. Beautiful girl, 14 years old, bright, intelligent, top of her class, and then all of a sudden, boom, she's got brain cancer and she's dying. And she knows it. And when I left, we talked. It was pleasant. We left. I left, and she smiled at me, a smile I'll never forget. And she said, you know, I've been offering it all for you. They called me. She died two weeks later. A little boy, six years old, leukemia from when he was an infant. All he knew was pain and suffering. One day he told me, you know, Father, the Blessed Mother told me that I should offer it up for you. And I'm still here, hoping against hope, thanking God every single time that I do this. You can't believe the landmines, the snares, the obstacles, the attacks, every year growing worse. And yet I'm still here. Why? Because some soul says yes. Some soul says yes to God. They love. And the fruit of that love is life. Spiritual life transmitted through unworthy fathers like me. We're in this together. You and I. Crucified love is the only love that is authentic. St. Teresa of Avila used to tell her sisters repeatedly, Sisters, love is the cross. And the cross is love. You love in so far as you, willing, or you are willing to sacrifice and no more. You love in so willing as you are so willing to sacrifice. Hmm? Talk is cheap. Authentic love is not. And so, love one another, as Jesus said. Abide in me, and I in you. And together, we'll run this race to the finish line. We'll win the fight. And we'll stand before God one day. And we'll hear these beautiful words. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, finally, now, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Once again, as always, entrusting ourselves to our blessed mother, let us pray. Hail Mary. Full of grace. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sister's just going to take these questions at random out of the out of the box and uh, uh, do the best I can to answer them. Okay. All right. This is. We have a sister in our parish who has openly opposed the Holy Father with regard to women's ordination. She says she must follow her conscience. Please explain. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'd be happy to. <laughs> I've answered. You know, in traveling all over the country, um, most of the questions you get, I, I've been doing this question and answer since I started, and most of the questions, I say 90% of them, are recurring. 
They're the same. People have these things on their mind. And, and this is a good question. And it's one of the things that has um, come up again uh, in the last year, um, especially since all the scandals and, you know, one of the um, responses is, well, uh, you know, we have too small a pool to draw from. If only we would get rid of celibacy uh, and allow women to be ordained, then we would have a much better situation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand the question a little bit. I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to bring in celibacy too because it's almost always uh, in one way or another tied in. This came up continually in the past year, um, and they had all kinds of experts on television being interviewed, you know, the debate format. They have the liberal and the conservative, and then they go at it. That seems to be what the media likes. Why celibacy? Uh, could we ordain married men priests? Yes, we could. We could. Theologically, that is possible. Um, were some of the apostles married? Yes. How could Peter have a mother-in-law if he wasn't married? Right? And I, I always interject at that point. A lot of people think that's how he became a saint. <laughs> And then I always apologize to all the mother-in-laws. <laughs> but, yes, um, we could, theologically speaking, it is possible, and it does still happen, uh, that married men are ordained. Ordained men are never allowed to marry. There is a distinction, and please note the distinction, uh, married men have been allowed to be ordained, but ordained men have never been allowed to marry in the Eastern Church or the West. Important distinction. But if we wanted to in the Latin Rite, in the Western Church, uh, could the Holy Father change the, uh, the discipline and say, all right, we're going to allow men to marry, you know, and then we will ordain a certain number of marriage. He could do that. Theologically speaking. The question isn't could he, the question is should he. And here's the argument, and nobody ever gets it right. All the experts on television, nobody got it right. Should we? I say no. Why not? Celibacy is a gift. Celibacy is a charism. That is a specific kind of a gift given to an individual for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ. That particular gift doesn't make a statement that marriage isn't good. Not at all. It's different. Marriage is a sacrament. It's great. It's holy. Uh, the fact that certain men are given this gift, and women, are given this gift to live perfect chastity and consecrated celibacy. Why? Now here's the crux of the argument. Why? Celibacy, when lived faithfully, begets spiritual life. They call us father. You can't be a father unless you have children, right? The term has no meaning otherwise. We're fathers. We have children, spiritual children. One of the ways, the main way you beget those spiritual children in the church, in the body of Christ, is through faithfully living celibacy. That breathes life into the body of Christ. It begets new life. At a time when we are in need of so much life, because there's a, the forces of death are at work, even in the church. At a time when we are in so much need of this infusion of life, why would we throw the specific gift designed to give that life back in God's face and say, no thanks, we don't want it? That's why we should preserve celibacy. Okay? That's that answer. Now to answer the real question here about women's ordination. Is it theologically possible for a woman to be ordained a priest? The answer is no. It is not theologically possible. Some people say, but it'd be a good idea. Maybe so. <laughs> you know, a lot of women I know have a lot of the great attributes. They could be wonderful priests in terms of their compassion, you know, their, their maternal instincts, their nurturing instincts. Absolutely. Matter of fact, I, in many respects, I think more of the women I know 
have some of the gifts necessary than a lot of the men I know. But that's not the way it is. Uh, it, the Pope didn't make it up. This came from Jesus himself. On Holy Thursday, two sacraments were instituted, the priesthood and the Eucharist. He called 12 the apostles. They were men. Were any of them better than his mother? Nope. Were any of them even her equal? Nope. Who is the greatest work of God's creating hand? Next to the humanity of Christ, what's the greatest work of God's creating hand? A woman? I'm sorry, it wasn't a man. A woman. The Blessed Mother has a singular position. That's greatness. Is any priest that ever lived, other than Jesus, the high priest, other than Jesus now, among human beings, Jesus is a divine person who assumed a human nature. Mary is a human person like us. Okay? Jesus is a divine person. That's a very significant distinction there. The point is, dignity, nobility, and greatness aren't determined by a ministry or a function. The greatest human being ever created is a woman, Mary, mother of the Lord. He didn't call her to be a priest. Was the Blessed Mother a priest? No. No. Is it theologically possible for a woman to be ordained a priest? If we get a new pope, could the new pope decide, well, we're going to ordain women. It's just a fair thing to do. Why? Because even the Pope doesn't have the authority to change the teaching of Jesus Christ. And he has said so in an apostolic letter on the ordination of men alone to priestly ministry. Now, to some people, to the uninitiated, to those who don't understand theology, uh, they take exception to that. They don't like it. It sounds biased, bigoted, unfair. Take it up with God. You don't have a problem with me. You don't have a problem with the Pope. You've got a problem with Jesus. That's who, that's who made it this way. That's like that old joke I tell over and over again, one of Bishop Sheen's jokes. I'm always stealing his jokes. I'm not clever enough to make up any of my own, so I just steal his. They're still good 50 years later. And he was preaching in California, I think at UCLA, and uh, there was a heckler in the back of the audience. And Bishop Sheen was talking about Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days. And the heckler said, how do you know Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days? Like somebody could say to me, how do you know a woman can't be a priest? Bishop Sheen said, well, I know because scripture says it, but, but I'll, you know, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And the heckler said, yeah, well, what if he isn't there? And he said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> And this person says, the nun said, well, I have to follow my conscience. Now, one of the talks that I have done consistently for the past 10 years is on conscience and the connection between freedom, conscience, and truth. She said, well, I have to follow my conscience. Conscience is not an independent entity. Conscience is something that has to be formed. Conscience is a subjective thing. And it has to be formed to the objective norm of truth. Church teaching. What's the church teach? Priestly ordination, the ministerial priesthood, is reserved for men alone. Like it or not, believe it or not, that's what it is. I have to form my conscience to the objective norm of truth. It, what, what, what does this say about that, poor sister? It says her conscience is deformed got a deformed conscience. Why? Because her conscience, the subjective entity, is not in conformity with objective truth. In other words, she's got to get her head straight. She's wrong. Actually, that's heresy. And I would make the position she's excommunicated in virtue of the act of not believing what we believe. And there are theologians and even some bishops who are still holding on to that, saying women can be ordained. No, they can't. That's an essential part of the faith. Why? It's one of the seven sacraments. 
If that were possible, you would find it in three places, or at least one of three places. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition, magisterial teaching. Is there any reference in any of those three to the possibility or the tradition of women being ordained priests? No. Not possible. Now, that goes down hard with some people, especially our contemporary way of thinking. I happen to think that one of the most noble, beautiful vocations is to be a mother. I have the highest regard for mothers. I got news for you, I ain't never going to be one. <laughs> but I don't intend to hold a placard and pick at the Vatican. <laughs> Unfair. Unfair. I can't be a mother. You say, you're out of your mind, boy. Why can't I be a mother? Because it's not in conformity with my nature. God didn't give me that nature. I, I, I can't do that. It's not possible for me. Same argument. I didn't make it up. The Pope didn't make it up. God ordained it. So, and what, uh, what's our job? To accept it as God has given it. And that's a function of humility. Next question, sister. Father, can you explain the value of indulgences? Also, what prayers for the Holy Father should we say? Mm -hmm. Okay. An indulgence is misunderstood very often. The church, through the power of the keys, you remember in the 16th chapter of Matthew, when uh, Jesus um, changed Simon's name to Peter, and he said, you are a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and whatever you hold bound on earth will be held bound in heaven, whatever you hold loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Under that general power of binding and loosing, you have, of course, confession. You have the power to determine moral and doctrinal um, teaching and also discipline. And the, it, the, in the tradition of the church, we've had this um, uh, teaching on indulgences. The church has the power to grant certain privileges to persons who accomplish certain things in accordance with the norms laid down by the church. Uh, you can receive benefits, indulgences, okay, uh, from the treasury of graces. Now, what's that? Treasury of graces. That's all the merits of Christ, that's infinite. Passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. The blessed among all the saints. That, there's a treasury of graces built up as the result of that. The church, as a, a, a kind of mediator between God and men. Now, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. But Jesus is one with his church. How do you separate the head from the body? You don't. Jesus works through his church. It's not apart from his church. Through his church. And Jesus has given the church the authority to grant indulgences. What is it, though? Well, you've got two kinds of indulgences. You've got a partial indulgence, you've got a, a full indulgence or a plenary indulgence. For instance, uh, somebody asked me, well, I, you know, I, I, the next time the church has a special thing like the um, Jubilee year, you know, where you could go make a pilgrimage to a certain place, get in you don't even have to do that. Say the rosary... In any chapel or church where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved, go to confession and communion. They usually say within eight days of, of performing the, the uh, act required. Um, say some prayers for the Holy Father's intentions. And there's one that they always leave out. You must have no attachment to sin. Now, all the rest of them are easy. For instance, all of you, uh, you have to have the intention to gain the indulgence, too. Okay? Let's say we want to get a plenary indulgence. Might as well go, go for the gusto, right? <laughs> what does that mean? That means a full remission of all the temporal punishment due to sin. Now, when we sin, there's two things involved. Guilt and punishment or expiation for the sin. When you hammer a nail on a board, that's when you sin, like a spike in your soul. 
You go to confession, the guilt is removed. Out comes the spine. What's left? A hole, a wound. That has to be filled in somehow. When we sin, Jesus said every last penny will be paid. After my reconversion to the faith, I read that and I said, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Man, I am in deep trouble. (laughs) Because I've been a pagan for 20 years and I'm never going to get out. I mean, I'm going to be in purgatory forever. Then I learned about the doctrine of indulgences. I learned that I could do certain things that the church prescribes. I'll tell you one of them. Attend a retreat or mission like y'all just did this weekend. We're going to do this right now. Best way to teach is to do, right? We're all going to get a plenary indulgence if we can right now. You've attended this retreat. That's the, the, uh, the thing, you know, the object. That's one of the things you can do that qualifies for plenary indulgence. You attended this retreat. All right. You intend to get the indulgence. What's an intent? You just do it right now. You think about it and you say, yeah, I want the plenary indulgence. Okay. We've done that. Uh, Go to confession. Some of you did that this weekend. You got, you know, the next week or so. Go to confession. Receive Holy Communion. Most of you all going to do that at Mass today. Uh, say some prayers for the, for the intentions of the Holy Ghost. What prayers? Well, it doesn't specify them. Uh, generally, our Father, Hail Mary, glory be, maybe creed. Say a few prayers for the intentions of the Holy Father. They're not specified. It can be up to you. Okay? Um, no attachment to sin. All right? Now, a lot of us have a favorite sin. Now, you might like to gossip. Now, you know you shouldn't do it, but it just feels so good. <laughs> you might be attached to that sin. Uh, some of us have, maybe, maybe have a habit of uh, lying, exaggerating the truth, whatever. You should make an intention. You want to sever that attachment to sin, especially serious sin, of course. You have to be free from serious sin, obviously. But even venial sin, you've got to break that attachment as best you can. Make that intention. Okay. All those things in place, then. I hope I didn't leave any out. Did I leave any out, sister, that you can think of? No. All right. My theological advisors. <laughs> <laughs> Sisters told me they listened to my catechism series several times, though by now they ought to be theological advisors. But, no, that, that's it. You perform the act, and there are many different things you can do. Say the rosary in a chapel or church where the Blessed Sacraments are removed. You can get plenary indulgence for doing that every single time. You can get one every day. That plenary indulgence, it can be used for you. In other words, let's say you've been, lived 50 years in mortal sin, committed everyone in the book. You go to confession, and then you uh, do whatever is required to receive the plenary indulgence, you know, let's say the rosary, or go to a mission or retreat, go to communion, or go to confession and communion, say the prayers for the intentions of the Holy Father, have no attachment in sin, plenary indulgence. What's that mean? I'll explain it to you like I did to a ma- mafia boss one time. It means that if you die without committing any more sins, you get on the elevator and go straight up. No stops in purgatory. Why? Because you've already been purified. How? Through the church's ability to apply indulgences. That's to apply the merits of that from the treasury of graces, which the church has. That's a plenary indulgence, full indulgence. There are other partial indulgences, you know, where you can gain a a partial remission of your sins, you know, uh, by different things. But the, the main thing most people are thinking about is a plenary indulgence. Plenary means full. Father, could you explain Matthew 13, 10 through 15, where Jesus says he speaks in parables in that they look without seeing and listen without hearing or understanding. And in their case, the, the, this prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. You will listen and listen again, but not understand 
see and see again, but not perceive. For the heart of the nation has grown coarse. Their eyes are dull of hearing. They have shut their eyes for fear that they should see with their eye, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and be converted and be healed by me. Why didn't Jesus want everyone to understand? That's a very good question, a very insightful question, and I could talk on that for a very long time. I'll try to condense it. In the first place, there's a mystery involved here. Does God want everybody to be saved? Yes. Yes. Does God give every human being sufficient grace to be saved? Yes, he does. Then what is he talking about here? The, one of the most frightening effects of sin is spiritual and moral blindness, deafness, being mute. I mean, you can't see it. You know, you ever try to explain the faith to somebody and said, oh, I can't see it. Why can't they see it? They're blind. And, and I can preach, as I often do, to say a thousand people or a million. doesn't make any difference. With technology, it's just as easier... Just as easy for me to preach to 10 million people as it is to preach to 10. Same effort required. I just stand in front of a TV camera and I go out to 10 million people. Now, principle. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. Every human being receives as they are able to receive. In other words, we have a kind of a filter. And that filter is comprised of our intelligence, our education, our life's experiences, environmental and and cultural factors. That constitutes a filter. And what we receive, whether through reading, hearing, whatever, passes through that filter. So things are received according to the disposition of the one receiving. So I can preach to 10 million people, and and each one of them receives it directly proportional to his ability to receive it. Okay? Now, the problem is, a lot of people don't check their filter. It's clogged up. It's defective. It's deficient. Right? I can preach to 10 million people, and I've done this in, in church. Let's say I'm in a parish and I'm preaching. And I, I, give, I, I talk about one of the things that I'll, like, oh, uh, alternative lifestyles, like they say now, right? Um, and I always start out saying, look, you've got to love everybody. God loves everybody. Does God love um, the, the gay person? Yes. God loves everybody. Now, God doesn't love sin. Make the distinction between loving the sinner and hating the sin. I've got to love everybody, though. I can't be bigoted. I can't be, uh, you know, I, I can't persecute any class of people for whatever reason. Objectively speaking, they may be dead wrong in mortal sin, objectively speaking. But I got to love them. Does Jesus love every sinner? Yes. He doesn't love their sin. The sin separates them. In a manner of speaking, and, and, and I use this in, in quotation marks, God hates sin. I mean, you say, well, God can't hate. In a way, he does. Why? Because he knows what it is. He knows it can separate his beloved child from himself. God loves the sinner, though. So I'll say, well, you've got to love all people. You've got to love the homosexual people. But, you know, you also, if you love them, you've got to be honest. You've got to be forthright. You've got to be firm in the truth. And one of the spiritual works of mercy is to admonish the sinner. But you've got to know how to do it. You don't do it with a billy club. You know? As like a, a surgeon doing very precise heart surgery, um, he doesn't use a bowie knife. You know, he uses a scalpel. That's a very delicate, precise instrument. And sometimes when we explain the faith, we've got to be very delicate and precise. We don't want to drive people away. But then people misunderstand me. I'll have some people, they used to call up my mother's house when I'd preach at home. and my They'd call my mother's house about 11.30 in the morning. 
And it was a woman who called and said, well, you young whippersnapper upstart of a priest, I've been Catholic for uh, 85 years, and I don't need to hear this, that, or other thing from you. And I said, well, that's very impressive. You've been Catholic for 85 years, but you think you ought to learn something by now. <laughs> and if you don't need to hear it from me, you sure need to hear it from somebody because you don't know what you're talking about. And they'll say, you're homophobic. You know, they listen to it, and, I will, and I'm always careful to be very gentle, and I lay that, that positive part out first. Now, you've got to love the people. You've got to love them. But I can't leave it at that and say, hey, uh, love them and let them do whatever they want. What kind of cowardice is that? That's not love. That's lack of love. But they, what did they hear? They heard that I hate those people. That's not what I said, but that's what they heard. Why did they hear that? Because things are received according to the disposition of the receiver. Now, that's a very important principle. If you learn that, that goes a long way toward helping you in a million life situations with some of your relatives and friends. You wonder why they don't get it? Well, that's why. They're not able to. Why? Sin blind. So, Jesus, truth incarnate, can you imagine what a preacher Jesus must have been? Can you imagine how perfect? I mean, the, uh, the, he, he must have attracted people just by his presence, the presence of God. And, and do you realize, despite that, despite his absolute perfection, many of them walked away. They didn't accept what he said. That makes me feel a whole lot better. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I don't have trouble, like because I, I, I mostly preach to people like you. And, and, and I have a very receptive audience because the other kind don't invite me. <laughs> they know what they're getting. But that's very important, okay? So that's what he meant. You know, hey, I can preach you, to you. I can tell you all the truth. But, you know, you'll be sitting right there. You won't see it. You won't hear it. That is the, one of the most dangerous, frightening aspects of sin. You commit serious sin, you're in danger of being deaf, blind, and dumb. You won't see the truth, you won't hear the truth, you won't speak the truth. You just can't. Your senses have been destroyed by sin. That's what it's about. We were told by a priest that parents' moral and financial obligations to educate, instruct, correct, guide our kids ends after completion of high school education that our kids have a free will and we, the parents, should not interfere with any further God's plan in their life. Am I my brother's keeper only after a certain age, situation, or condition in life? Well, some questions, you know, they don't have clear answers. This is one of them, okay? Now, would I, would, would I be hard on that priest? No. But do I see what the person's talking about? who asked the question, yes. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, yeah, I am. How long? Well, always. Till he gets to heaven. At least. Then he's safe. He's not safe till he gets there. I'm even my brother's keeper after he's dead. I'm going to pray for him. And by the way, if I check out tomorrow, y'all better pray for me. Don't you be leaving me in purgatory forever now. <laughs> so I am my brother's keeper, yes. And, and what if it's my child? Well, sure. Do, do I have some kind of moral responsibility? Yes, but it's not the same as when they're minors. You know, when they're adults, they're adults. When they're minors, they're minors. In other words, like my mother used to say it. She said, as long as you're in this house, you're going to do this and this and this and this, and that's the way it is. You know, my, my mother ha ha had, you know, she had the mom hat. But, but that, that spelled two ways, M-O-M and B-O-S-S. <laughs> and she was not disinclined to enforce the edicts she laid down. Now she, my mother broke more brooms over me after I was 14 because I was way bigger than her, but she wasn't afraid to come after me. And um, all right. So you have to educate. You have to uh, form the children, you do it through their, their um, years up until they're an adult. Now, do you still 
help them? You know, if you see them doing something self-destructive, do you have a right to say something? Yes. Now, here's the crux of this question, because I've heard it a billion times, and here's what it really means. My son, my daughter, is uh, they want to get married in the gazebo in the park. They don't want to get married in the church. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. Or, um, you know, they are engaged in such and such self-destructive behavior. And I always ask them this question. I'll say, Mom, Dad, do you suppose at this point there's any chance your son, your daughter, doesn't know how you feel about that issue? And they say, oh, no. They know how I feel about it. They know real well what I think about it. What are you beating a dead horse for? You've already formed them. They know. You just answered the question for yourself. Sometimes the only thing you can do is shut up and pray. Now, my mother had a brilliant preaching career up until I was 15. And then it ended. And she started talking less and praying more. That doesn't mean you can't put in a word of instruction. That doesn't mean you can't tell them what you think. You can. You can. But do they have a free will? Yes. At a certain point, you've got to let go and let God. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you'll have peace. You never just say, okay, you're out of here. Forget it. I'm not going to even think about you anymore. No. You accompany them all the way to heaven. But unlike when they're minors, where you're accompanying them with constant direction, correction, etc., you're accompanying them with prayer and with sacrifice and with sacramental grace. You, they always have you, and it's a good thing. Let me tell you something. If people like me would be in hell if it wasn't for their mother or their father or their grandparents, you know, praying for them. And, and so, you know, that, that, that's the kind of question that it's, you know, got kind of both sides on it. You have to have a certain amount of discretion and prudence. I, I, I just want to ask a supplementary mm -hmm. question yes. because they said financial and moral. Mm -hmm. And I would say a lot of people's questions after high school is, mm -hmm. my son or daughter wants to go to this and this ah, school. Should okay. I have to pay for that school okay. if it's not a Catholic school and I think right. it'll do moral right. harm to them? Yeah, well, and, and I think a parent has a right to do that. I mean, do you, let, let's say, uh, you know, my daughter, my son, they're when they want to go to college, they're 18, and they say, well, uh, I say, yeah, I think it'd be great you go to Franciscan University of Steubenville. And they say, yeah, right, I'm going to Harvard. And I say, well, I don't, you know, in the first place, we don't have enough money to send you to Harvard. Unless you, you want to get a scholarship to Harvard, okay. But then again, I might say, well, even if you get a scholarship to Harvard, I don't want you to go to Harvard. Because those people have been educated into imbecility. And I don't want too much of that rubbing off on you. <laughs> Do you have a right? Well, yeah. Do you have a right to say, you know, I'm not going to spend $100,000 for you to go someplace where the liberal thinking in, in that environment will distort and possibly destroy your mind? Do you have a right to do that? Of course you do. Uh, you have discretion. You have a, a broad amount of discretion. Um, if you can afford to send them calls, fine. Uh, you may say, you may decide, you know, like my mother did. My mother didn't have any money. She said, you want to go to college? You better start working. She told me that when I was 12. And so I began working as a janitor in school, 5 a.m. up every morning, going cleaning toilets and sweeping floors and the money going in the bank. For what? From a college education. On my mother's salary as a nurse in those days, she couldn't send me to college. She couldn't even, it was a lot cheaper back then. But she told me very early on, and you want to know something, that probably did me more good than if it had been handed to me on a silver platter. Sometime, you know, if you can afford to do things for your kids, that's great. But you better think what you're doing. You may have more than enough money to, to provide the things that you didn't have. And that's a, a great thing. But do it in such a way that exhibits wisdom. Because I know uh, uh, an 
an uncountable number of people who have been ruined because they had everything handed to them. They didn't have to work for it. You know, they got maleducated. They can't think. You know, and so um, you, you, you just think. You pray, you think, you ask for guidance, and then you speak. And your word is law. God's power and authority resides in parents. And don't forget it. In this age, parents have often abdicated their authority. Just like bishops and priests have often abdicated their authority. Well, somebody's going to assume the seat of power, and it might be the devil. So think before you act. I understand the Holy Father has said our invasion of Iraq at this time could not be considered a just war. If this is true, when can a war be considered just? Well, you know, that, that, that's a kind of complex theological uh, issue on the, the, what's called the just war theory. Uh, I, I can't go into it fully here. Um, if you look in the, on, in the section of the Catechism on the Fifth Commandment, you'll find that teaching. Um, we all know that war is a horrible thing. Now, let me tell you who really know, knows that war is a horrible thing. Anybody who's fought in war. Uh, I know of plenty of military people that have been in, in combat. Uh, very few of them would say they liked it. You know, they did it as a duty. So war is a horror. And it is to be avoided, but not at any cost. Okay? Now, the situation we have today, and by the way, in case you don't know, President Bush is extremely interested in what the Pope has to say, and he consults with him uh, through representatives, and, and he consults with the Holy See on moral issues. He's not disinterested. You know, there have been some who don't do that. I can tell you, he does. Now, on this issue, this is a weird time in history. This whole concept of preemptive strikes, um, we don't understand that. Very few people understand that. And um, to take the just war theory and to apply it uh, as it's set forth, in this case, is very difficult. It's not an easy thing. I probably sat in the first class or seminar, whatever you want to call it, on anti-terrorism that the United States Army ever had. It was just a few weeks after the Six-Day War in 1967. And we had uh, an intelligence officer from the CIA and his counterpart from the Israeli Army and we had a few um, senior non-commissioned officers from special forces. And they gave a talk. They said one of the, the most uh, significant dangers. Now, remember, this is back when the Cold War was going on. 1967, when Vietnam was, was going hot and heavy. They said one of the greatest dangers that will be facing us is this danger of what we call terrorism today. I don't remember they used the word back then, terrorism, but that's what they're talking about. And they said a terrorist can strike any time, any place, any way. And you cannot defend every place, every way, all the time. And the only way to protect yourself from such attacks is through preemptive strikes. There is no way to assume a merely defensive posture and survive. Now, you think about the logic of it, and you draw your own conclusions. Uh, myself, uh, I, I, I believe that's true. I, I, how many September 11th? You know, the president's between a rock and a hard place. He really is. What the heck's he going to do? Uh, we have another, listen, September 11th, you know, the terrorists are already saying it. You know, they say, you, you think September 11th was something? That's a walk in the park compared to what you got coming. I believe them. I believe them. 
You think that they don't have the ability to attack with biological or chemical weapons? You, 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 you put, put one bomb or you detonate uh, one device with anthrax in the center of Manhattan or Boston and watch what happens. Do you think that's difficult? I'm telling you, that's so easy, you won't sleep the rest of your life thinking about it. That is very easy to do. You cannot defend everywhere, all the time, from everything. So this business of preemptive strikes, listen, that, that's a difficult thing. There's not really a historical precedent for that. We don't do that. I mean, that seems to be excessive. But I don't know. Uh, you know, more than 30 years ago, I sat in that first class that the United States Army ever had on anti-terrorist tactics. And way back then, it was almost prophetic. They said the only one way to do it. And I believe they were right. But, you know, it's just a tough thing. I'm glad I'm not the Pope or the President. They have all the weight of the world on their respective shoulders. But, um, you know, just war, look, look in the Catechism on the Fifth Commandment, and it lays out the details. I don't have time to go into that. That's a complex theory. But you can find at least the beginnings of an explanation of it in the Catechism. If someone leaves their Catholic faith for a non-denominational religion, I think the, the question is, can they have a chance for heaven? Yeah. Now, that, that's one of the... Do um, we have any water? Oh, there it is. Um, that's one of those recurring questions. Uh, that, that gets asked almost every place that I go. And it's one of the questions that... Um, periodically gets me in trouble because people don't like the answer that I give. But I'll give you the church's answer. You know, I, I just don't... I, most of these things, like this last question, you have maybe a little bit of my personal opinion. It's not just straight theology, you know, but I always try to tell you that. Um, uh, this one's pretty straight. God gives sufficient grace to everybody to be saved. Okay? Um, it, it, outside of the church, there's no salvation. You know, that, that's a, a question that, that comes up very often. Is that a true statement? Yes. But do you know what it means? Usually no. Outside the church, there's no salvation. What brings you into the church normally? Or the ordinary way of entering the church? Baptism. Valid baptism. That, that's what brings you into the church. That's the ordinary way that you enter the church. Outside the church, there's no salvation. Do Baptists have valid baptism? Yep. You know, do Presbyterians? Yep. Pentecostals? Mm -hmm. Form and matter. Pour the water. Immersion in water. You say the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's valid baptism. Okay? They intend to baptize. Is the person baptized? Yes. Does baptism bring you into the church? Yes. But we all know that beyond that, there are differences in what we believe. Absolutely true. Um, there's, now, this is a mystery. You've got to understand a lot of things come into the category of mystery. So you can't perfectly and rationally explain them. The, the bottom line is God knows. You know, somebody asked me, can my brother-in-law who left the Catholic Church and joined uh, Assemblies of God... Is it, is it possible he could be saved? And I have to say, yes. How could I say no? Am I God? No. I don't know all the details. I don't know what's in his mind. I don't know what he's experienced. Any human being can be saved. Can a Buddhist be saved? Yes. But he didn't save through Buddhism. Can a Jew be saved? Yes. But he isn't saved through Judaism. There's one true church. Y'all come to the right place. And there's no question about that. But I, I, we can't be triumphalistic about it. If through no fault of their own, a person doesn't come to the fullness of revelation, can they be saved? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And so that's a misconception. You know, 
it, outside the church, there's no salvation. A lot of people think that means outside the visible confines of the Catholic Church. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. You say, but I don't like that. Well, I, I understand. But that don't change anything. That's the way it is. A lot of people are like the prodigal son's older brother. Boy, I, I, I worked in slave. I did everything right. He didn't do anything right. He went off and squandered his inheritance on loose women and so forth and so on. And here he comes back. You kill the fatted calf. I get nothing. That's, how, that's what they're like. That's God's business. Let's say you got a mass murder. Osama bin Laden. All of a sudden, right before he dies, Osama bin Laden gets hit by the light of God, same one that hit St. Paul, and all of a sudden he knows in his mind and his heart that he's got to repent. That there, that there is a God and there is a true church, and, and in his heart he changes. He accepts that grace. There's such a thing called baptism of desire. Does baptism of desire bring you into the church? Yes. Is it a sacrament? No. Does it bring you to the church? Yes. Can you be saved that way? Yes. Well, then what about us? We do everything the hard way. We're the ones who have to abide by all the rules. <laughs> know that you, in doing so, are contributing to the salvation of all people. Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood. Here come another question. I'll preempt this one. I'll give you the answer. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Therefore, anybody who doesn't receive Holy Communion, who isn't Catholic, can't be saved. Wrong. There is a oneness in the church. And there is also a oneness in all creation. Today when I celebrate Mass... When I receive Jesus in Holy Communion, there is going to be a power that mystically radiates from me to the whole church and everybody in the church, and through the church to the whole world, actual graces will go out. People could receive the light and grace of conversion, uh, somebody on the edge of death in China. Something takes place in their heart, they change, they turn, and they say, in their own way, somehow, Lord, have mercy on me. Is that enough to be saved? Yes. And I contributed to their salvation. And that's what it means to be a Catholic, having the fullness of Christianity. Jesus came to set the captives free. What do you come for? I've come to do his will. Jesus, the head and his mystical body, were one. What's his mission? You know, that, that's a common question asked in theology. What's the mission of the Redeemer? Redemption. Why did Jesus assume a human nature and become like one of us in everything except sin? Salvation, redemption, that's his mission. What's our mission? Same thing. Couldn't be any different. Same thing. So what I do, what I am, affects others, especially sacramentally. Receiving the Eucharist results in power. And even if you never say anything or you, you don't go to China and preach, the power of grace can radiate from you and reach to the far corners of the earth. You see, that's, that's, we don't talk about that. But that's what we have in the Catholic Church. Sacramental power. Okay? I didn't mean to give a homily on these, each one of these questions, but I can't help myself. I just like to follow up on that because I think the question is, the, the concern of the person is that that person was baptized Catholic, mm -hmm. was brought up Catholic, and has left the church. I know. And, and, uh, and the answer remains the same. Okay. Can they be saved? Yes. Is it a good idea to do that? No. Is it a good idea to leave the fullness of divine revelation, the full means of salvation, and go someplace where there's less than that? No. We have a hard enough time right here with everything we have, all the advantages. But you cannot say, in the negative, you cannot say it's not possible for such a person to be saved. That would be an egregiously erroneous statement. What if they teach heresy and result that? What if they what? Teach, teach heresy and result Well, once again, only God knows the mind. Only God knows what they went through, what they're <laughs> Objectively speaking, 
you could say, hey, boy, they're in big trouble. No question about that. But subjectively, see, there's a difference between the objective order that's talking about something in the abstract. You know, a situation objectively taken. That's one thing. It's another thing, then, to subjectively impute it. That's what we can't do, okay? Uh, another common question comes up, uh, well, you're judging them. You're judging your brother. And it says in the Bible, judge not lest you be judged. And then that, that's a, a whole dissertation that I've often given, the difference uh, in judgment. When I was a little boy, my mama said, before you cross the street, look to the left and to the right. If there's no traffic coming, you can cross. If there's traffic coming, you can't cross. That's a judgment. That's a rational judgment. A moral judgment. Somebody's wallet fell out of their, their purse, their pants, whatever. It's sitting over there. I, I, I know who it belongs to. I take, man, there's $8,000 in that. And that sure would make my life easier nowadays. And so I have a temptation. I have to make a moral judgment. Take it? Don't take it. Is that a judgment? Yes, it is. That's a moral judgment. Can I and must I make rational and moral judgments? Yes. That's in the objective order. Now, Joey and Susie Q are living together, and I know they're not married. Now, in the objective order, I say if um, party A and B are living together, they're not married, and they're not just playing tiddlywinks, then they're probably living in sin. In the objective order, I can say that. I can make a moral judgment like that. But I can't subjectively impute guilt to an individual because I just don't know the circumstances. Only God knows. Only God knows. That doesn't mean you can't instruct that you can't teach in the objective order, but then to impute guilt subjectively, I mean, we, we can do it to a certain extent, but you've got to be careful because you might not know all the facts. You, you may say, well, my son, and, my son and his girlfriend, they're living together in sin. Can I instruct them? You bet you can. You can tell them, but once again, he probably knows exactly how you feel about it, Mom, and so you better start praying more and talking less. Because talking becomes counterproductive at a certain time. So, can a person be saying, it's not a good idea. Don't think I'm encouraging that. That Catholics can just leave and go any place they want. That is a terrible thing. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. What we have has been given to us for a reason. The other Christian denominations only have two sacraments. And they don't have any of the sacraments of healing. Remember that. The only two valid sacraments they have is baptism and matrimony. The other five sacraments require a validly ordained ministerial priest. If God gave us seven, not two, seven, that means we need them. And so it is not prudent to go someplace where you can't get them. It's not a good idea. It doesn't look good. The prognosis isn't good. But I can't make an absolute statement and say, you're going to hell for sure, because you left the Catholic Church, went over there. I, he may have encountered a child abusing or homosexual priest that scarred his mind or her mind terribly. And their experience with the Catholic Church is that. Now, admittedly, you, you, that's not a good reason to leave. That's terrible. It's horrible. But there are what we call mitigating circumstances in law and in moral theology, too. And so we don't know to the degree that person was damaged, their judgment was impaired. And so we have to be reluctant to impute guilt to any subject of action because we just aren't smart enough. Only God is. We don't know. God knows. We take one more. Okay. Provided a priest is not sick or has or extenuating has extenuating circumstances, emergencies, etc., how often should he say mass? He should say mass every day, but that's not a precept. You could do one more. That's a quick one, sister. Do one more. Uh, he should do it every day, but that's not a precept. It's not a sin if he doesn't. 
Okay? Mm. He should. He should do it every day. But um, there's not a precept. Uh, is there a precept? Um, yeah, Sunday and Holy Days of Obligation. That's the precept. But priests are encouraged strongly by the church to celebrate Mass every day. True. Okay. This is a... Okay. Uh -huh. I have always believed that the Holy Eucharist is solely the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Recently, I heard it said that when we receive the Holy Eucharist, we receive not only the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we also receive the Father and the Holy Spirit. Is this really true? You said this morning, or so I understood, that wherever there is the Son, the Father, or the Holy Spirit, all three are present. Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood. He did not mention the Father or the, or the Son. I meant, thank you, Father. That's a good theological question requiring a certain amount of theological uh, precision. But I got it. Never fear. <laughs> when we receive Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Now, yes, it's Jesus. Not only his body and blood, but his soul and divinity. When we receive the blessed Eucharist, right? From the moment the consecration takes place, the bread and wine is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. I say the divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, the divinity of Jesus Christ, there's only one God. There's three divine persons. Wherever Jesus is, there the Father and the Holy Spirit must be in virtue of divine perichoresis or the circumcision. How you like that for some fancy theological term? <laughs> and that's the correct answer. Wherever Jesus is, there the Father and the Holy Spirit must be. Must be. Absolutely, necessarily, must be. Why? Because there's only one God. And at the consecration, the bread and wine is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That means Jesus, true God, as well as true man. And true God means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wherever Jesus is, there the Father and the Holy Spirit must be, must be, by the very definition of God. And that, the, the, a lot of different doctrinal principles, mainly the Trinity comes into play in that one. So I know it sounds too good to be true, but it is. When you receive Jesus, do, are, are you the temple of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. St. Paul says that, right? Do you not know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, 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 then can I say I'm the temple of the Trinity? Amen, brother. You are. The temple of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You, you, you want to read more about that? Read some from uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity. She has a lot to say about that. Are we the temple of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes, we are. Why? Because there's only one God, and he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 